Climate change, melting icebergs, Kyoto Protocol, greenhouse gas emissions. Are these issues best left to environmentalists and scientists? Should you and I and other ordinary folk around the world really worry about these issues? Yes, we should. Because our own behavior determines the fate of our environment. Our actions today have consequences for our children tomorrow and their children after that. Planet Earth is changing, rain patterns are evolving, glaciers are melting, temperatures are changing, which means there's less water for crops in some parts of the world, while in other parts of the world there is flooding. Ideally, we should be proactive. But most of the time we will be reactive, so we're going to have to find new innovative ways to manage harsh climatic conditions. Can science and technology help us manage climate change in India? I'm Manvi Dhillon and you're watching DuPont Presents The Power of Shunya Quest for Zero. And today we're on a quest for zero carbon emissions. So is it all gloom and doom or is there a silver lining when it comes to the environment? Who better to kick off the discussion than Dr. R.K. Pachori, well-known environmentalist and chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Dr. Pachori, thanks very much for your time today. Let's kick off with your latest insights and status when I say climate change. Where are we today? What are the priority issues? Well, there's a whole range of issues that I think we as uh, members of human society should be concerned about. Climate change is happening and we have said very categorically in the fifth assessment report of the IPCC that most of the warming that has taken place since the middle of the last century up to now is the result. We can say this with a confidence of 95% or more. Uh, is the result of human actions. That means the concentration of greenhouse gases that's built up in the atmosphere. When industrialization began, we had 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's now exceeded 400 parts per million. And this is leading to several impacts. Uh, sea level rise, for instance, since the beginning of the last century, the average sea level rise because of melting of all the bodies of ice and the thermal expansion of the ocean has been 19 centimeters. Now that's pretty serious. If you are living in a coastal area, you're living in a small island state, then clearly this amount of increase in the sea level it can be threatening to life and property. If you look at temperature increase since the beginning of the last century up to 2010, the average temperature increase has been uh, 0.85 degrees Celsius. So that's almost one degree average increase. And let's remember that the temperature difference, average temperature difference between the ice ages and the interglacial periods is just about four degrees or so. So if we are going to hit three or four degrees Celsius, then you're asking for very serious trouble. You could get sea level rise of several meters. And in any case, today, it's not just the increase in temperature. There are extreme events, extreme precipitation events. I mean, like you see in Jammu and Kashmir, and I'm not saying that this is the result of climate change. But what I will say categorically is that events of this nature will become more intense and more frequent in the future. And that's been happening. The trend is very, very clear. What are the kind of innovations that you would like to see, driven by science and technology, happen on a wider, larger scale in India? Well, in the transport sector, for instance, uh, unfortunately, you find uh, the share of road transport has been going up, both with respect to freight and passenger traffic. What you need is innovation in terms of bringing about a major improvement in the efficiency and the speed of the railways. because. Uh, rail traffic and rail transportation 
is far more energy efficient, will, it will burn much less fossil fuels than the same amount being carried on roads. So transportation is one. Transportation is one. Buildings are an extremely important target. Well, firstly, you design the building in such a way that you minimize the demand for energy. And then all of it is met from photovoltaic panels, from a biomass gasifier, and something which you find in some of the old buildings as a principle. We have four earth air tunnels through which we blow air which goes into the living spaces. And the thing is, if you go four meters below the surface of the earth, the temperature is uniform throughout the year with very minor variation. So if you blow air through a well-designed tunnel, and of course this takes a lot of calculation, then you get uh, warm air in the winter and you get cool air in the summer. So it really serves the purpose of air conditioning. So innovation can make an enormous difference in dealing with this problem. This show is called The Power of Shunya, Quest for Zero. Can we realistically talk of a quest for zero carbon emissions in India? Well, worldwide we'll have to do that because we have assessed in the fifth assessment report that if we want to limit temperature increase by the end of this century to two degrees Celsius, then by the end of this century, we will have to go into the range of zero or negative emissions of greenhouse gases. And human society can do it. It is within our means. We have the power, we have the economic muscle, we have the, the, ingenuity. the ingenuity to be able to do it. So, you know, all we need to do is to treat this as a challenge. And to my mind, this would be an extremely exciting journey. Brick, cement and mortar is changing the face of India's landscape, one building at a time. But sustainable development is the key challenge in a rapidly urbanizing world. And developing practices that work for a low carbon future. Shanghai, New York, New Delhi, big cities, impressive buildings, grand architecture. That's the trend and it's catching on. I'm here in the outskirts of Chandigarh at the Mohali campus of the Indian School of Business. The campus is impressive. We all marvel at these concrete miracles, but how often do we think about how these buildings work? Let me explain. Fact one, atmospheric temperature affects indoor temperature. Fact two, the hotter it is outside, the harder and longer you have to work your conventional central air conditioning system. Now here's a lesser known fact. There are some green buildings, buildings with a soul environmentally conscious buildings, like the Mohali campus of the Indian School of Business. This campus doesn't just teach its students courses in leadership and vision, it's leading the charge on environmentally sustainable buildings. An incubator of ideas. Sustainability is important because just because of our survival. I mean, we are breathing air. If it's not fresh, we are the ones who are at fault. We need AC. We are running AC for, what, three, four hours a day minimum. How to make it cheaper? How to make it sustainable? Environment is the context in which we operate. You pick up any industry, any industry whatsoever. So you, you take up manufacturing, iron ore, energy, anything, everything that we need to create value. We get it from the environment. The Mohali campus of the Indian School of Business is the place Arun Shinoi looked to for launching a game-changing idea in indoor air cooling. Traditional air conditioners, uh, as we might all know, are energy guzzlers. Uh, India, in India, uh, most of the energy supplies uh, come from coal. So any building that is using a number of energy guzzling devices in it uh, would have a larger carbon footprint, which means that it would have uh, it would result in uh, significant emissions, and would have a have an adverse effect on the environment. Working together with engineer Mandar Kaprikar, the geothermal cooling system technology was developed to work with India's climate conditions at the Mohali campus of the Indian School of Business. The geothermal cooling principle is this. Cold water from a chiller plant 
circulates through the building and absorbs the heat. The heated water from the chiller passes through the geothermal heat exchanger. This heat exchanger cools the water as the water flows through the underground pipe system. This cooled water flows back into the building and cools it. What in a nutshell is the science behind the geothermal cooling systems that you have come up with? See the ground uh, below about 10 meters of depth uh, maintains its temperature at a constant level. Okay? And this temperature in a given region is uh, lower than the ambient temperature outdoor uh, for most parts of the year. Okay? In other words, the cooler uh, ground ambient uh, below the ground it provides a winter-like environment, right? And uh, our air conditioning systems like winter-like environments because they consume lower energy during winter and higher energy during summer. Now that we have provided them a winter-like environment throughout the year, they will always consume lower energy. And that's the science. With green technologies that care for our planet, the learning resonates through the campus. We are the largest user of a geothermal system. We have a 234 ton system working for us. We are upgrading it to going to 300 ton. So one full chiller will go to this. Uh, we wouldn't have gone to there if it didn't make business sense. Uh, it is helping us save roughly 1,000 units of power every day. We save something like 10,000 liters of water every day. We also save a lot of chemicals, both in terms of money and the chemicals, what it does to the environment. The goal is gunning for Shunya, whether it is in aiming for a minimal carbon footprint or developing infrastructure and technologies that respect our environment. Shunya for us is uh, buildings that are net zero energy, buildings that have a zero carbon footprint and buildings that can uh, cause zero emission. Imagine if every single building in India started adopting such innovative technologies. Right? Aren't we then really very close to the uh, power of Shunya? Clearly, modern buildings don't just need concrete, steel, cement, glass and precise engineering. They need a soul too. Today, you've seen how a small change in mindset can have a huge benefit for the environment. Fumes, toxic emissions, thick black smoke billowing out of a factory, a far too common sight in many industrial areas. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, they form the black smoke and they do the most damage to the environment. The data on carbon emissions is grim. Did you know that India is the world's third biggest emitter of carbon dioxide after China and America? We've managed to push Russia into fourth place. But there is hope. Today we're going to introduce you to some innovators who see potential in the problem. These innovators are using polluting carbon emissions as raw material for carbon nanotubes, a black powder that can be used to make products as diverse as cement, steel and even electric goods. A manufacturing industry might be the backbone of an economy, but it comes with an ugly underbelly. These toxic fumes pose a potential threat to the climate. A tyre recycling unit located 35 kilometres from Hyderabad, emitting hazardous smoke. Can one recreate the smoke into something valuable? What is happening here at this tyre recycling unit? As you can see the tyre pyrolysis industry, uh, these guys burn uh, 3 tonnes of tyre per every day and during this process they emit 1 tonne of gas. We collect those gas and convert them into CNTs. So you can imagine that 70% of carbon can be reduced out of the 30% can be converted into CNTs. So you are getting a profit out of nothing. Introducing this patented process is Carbon Continuum Private Limited. 
a first of its kind technology that transforms harmful carbon emissions into something useful carbon nanotubes or CNTs what are carbon nanotubes in layman terms so the carbon nanotubes are an advanced form of carbon so these form of carbons are 100 times stronger than steel and 300 times electrical conductive than copper so these allotropes when used in uh, appropriate quantums can drastically improve the quality of the material uh, for example there might be a possibility of building uh, a, a, a construction of a building uh, using the entire of carbon nanotube in its steel cement and brick can withstand up to 1000 years whereas the current uh, 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 construction of buildings can withstand only up to 100 or 150 years so using our nanotechnological skills we identified this process and we thought uh, this would be the best benefit to the environment as we are not letting out any uh, gases getting uh, outside the atmosphere so which is a major cause of uh, the climate change and this reactor is the heart of this innovation not letting harmful gases out into the atmosphere which is a major cause of climate change just walk us through exactly what's happening here including every element of the reactor sure. step by step we tap the gas in between and take this gas into this reactor through this pipe green pipe you can see these cylinders are the uh, filled with the half of the amount of water where the particles suspended here and the dry gas is sent uh, into this uh, vessel where actually the moisture will get trapped down so since gas is always lightweight it always travel upwards so we have collected this gas to this pipe and uh, take it to the flow meter which will control the pressure and flow of the gas which is going inside the reactor to get reacted with the catalyst once the reaction is completed we stop the machine we uh, remove the baggage filter we just tap that and we collect the cnt powder in the form of powder The final output is this black powder which is then purified to give commercially viable carbon nanotubes. CNTs have wide applications in different sectors like electronics, automobiles and even construction. A company that's still in its nascent stage, Carbon Continuum has big plans of expanding its footprint into other industries polluting the environment. Imagine we're talking about 10 years in the future. Who do you think typically yes. your corporate industrial partners would be? Which industries would they be from? Today, uh, the carbon nanotubes are used in very specialized industries such as aerospace, uh, defense and high-end electronics. But we, our focus would be to cut down costs and make it more affordable to the masses. We identify industries like steel, rubber, cement, plastic, automobiles to be benefited out of this. A technology that has one of the most effective ways of carbon capture. A process that has the potential to change the dynamics of climate change globally. Carbon Continuum Limited is on a quest for zero carbon emissions. We have seen two exciting projects, each doing their part to work with our environment rather than against it. Now let's understand from Dr. R.K. Pachori the level and nature of innovation that's required to tackle the challenge of climate management. You alluded to how managing the effects of climate change is almost as important as trying to limit future negative effects on the climate. Why is managing the effects of climate change and adjusting and adapting as important as... Um... Well, it's, uh, climate change is essentially a collective problem. I mean, it faces all living species on this planet. So while, of course, you need action at the level of the community, at the level of towns and cities, uh, sub-national levels, national levels, and the international levels, ultimately, it's the individual mm -hmm. who has to start taking this problem seriously. In a democracy, fortunately, if all the members of society realize that something needs to be done, then our leaders will also act. And therefore, I would submit that perhaps the most important contribution we can make to meeting this challenge and solving this problem is to create awareness on the reality and the truth underlying climate change. When you were accepting the Nobel Peace Prize, you referenced Vasudeva Kutumbakam. 
What does that mean? How do you apply it to your philosophy on climate change and climate management? What Vasudev Kutumukam means that climate change is clearly one subject in which this applies universally across the globe. So I believe that we must realize that if there are conflicts in some part of the world which are exacerbated by climate change, they are going to affect everybody. If people are going to be displaced, where are they going to go? They become boat people moving to different parts of the globe. Can we apply the principle of Shunya or the quest for zero to climate management? rather than greenhouse gases and carbon emissions? Well, Shunya to my mind is, um, is the embodiment of knowledge because it's the Shunya which really brought about a major revolution in the way human beings deal with numbers, with transactions and everything that has a mathematical basis. And I think if we apply this uh, as a philosophy, as a principle that we need innovation, we need knowledge, then I think all of us will be able to not only harness the power of knowledge, but apply it in our daily lives and on a collective basis whereby we can solve this problem. And I think this problem is solvable. All we need to do is move in the direction of what Shunya has taught us. Dr. Pachori, it's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Climate change is perhaps the greatest threat to planet Earth. Most scientists agree that the Earth is warming at an alarming rate and the onus lies on us humans. Today we've seen two innovations that offer hope. Innovations that could even arrest climate change. Well, that's it on this edition of DuPont Presents The Power of Shunya Quest for Zero, a show that celebrates science and innovation, technologies that could secure our future, human ingenuity that could reduce our challenges to zero. Till next week then, goodbye.